Hello and welcome to this episode in our In Conversation series. I'm Andrew Guile, a solicitor and a director here at GN Law and I'm with my colleague. I'm Luke Cowles, I'm an associate solicitor in the Police Actions Department. Today we're going to revisit uh, DBS certificates and have another look at that. Um, there's another podcast that we've done on the same topic. Yes. Um, so uh, if you have a look at the list of videos, uh, come podcasts that, that, that we've done, uh, you'll find the earlier um, episode looking at DBS certificates. So we're going to start today with a bit of a recap of just yes. sort of some of the basics um, of the sort of DBS certificates that exist, um, the sort of uh, levels and checks that can be done. And we're going to go back and have a very brief sort of preparatory look at the case of um, L from back in um, uh, 2009, um, and then move forward and have another look at, at another look at a new case, uh, sorry, of AR, uh, and then come on to some um, some other more recent uh, newsworthy uh, additions, which is a bit of an extension of um, of this sort of these sorts of issues. So um, take it away, Luke. So, okay, so let's let's have just a recap of some of the basics of the check types and, and yeah, what, we're, what we're talking about. So certainly there hasn't been a huge change in terms of check types since our last video. You still have two major checks, uh, standard checks and enhanced checks. Uh, standard checks are a lot more smaller in nature. They basically record details of spent, unspent convictions, uh, cautions, reprimands and warnings held on the police national computer. Um, and then when you're looking at the enhanced check, which is generally where all the case laws are sort of dealing with and certainly the case we'll look at today, um, it includes an extra section um, and people have different words for it, but essentially it's a miscellaneous section. Some people call it soft intelligence yeah. um, and that can relate to allegations or, or, or different sorts of things. Um, and, uh, and, and unproven allegations. Yes, well, absolutely. Yeah, we'll come on to this, obviously. Uh, absolutely. So, I mean, the case we'll be dealing with, like you say, today, it deals with one where it does go to court and there's an acquittal. Yeah. Um, but does the acquittal spell the end or is it time for that individual to be very happy about it or is there still more to come that they're going to have to battle? Um, so looking briefly at the L case, the reason we mention it is simply because it is still the, the leading case that does get quoted um, and certainly is quoted in this decision because it's the sort of first time that they try and redress the balance between uh, the right of the public on the one hand to sort of know about certain types of allegations and looking at risk and we'll come on to that a bit later but then of course the, the right of the individual in terms of their personal rights for well, certainly under article 8 employment being uh, the most common one and certainly again uh, an issue here as well that we'll, we'll come to um, just as a, a way of a reminder um, actually this case is a very good and useful um, summary of L's case if, if anyone wants to look at it from paragraph 27 um, it says, L's case itself doesn't involve a criminal charge. Uh, the claimant had been employed by an agency providing staffing to schools, which required her to apply for an ECRC, what, what was called an ECRC at that point, but enhanced check, essentially. Yeah. Um, the certificate disclosed that she herself had no criminal convictions, but gave details about her child, who had been included on the Child Protection Register on the ground, among other things, of alleged inadequate parental provision uh, supervision by her. And the key here is her job is one that she's applying to be a supervisor of children. Um, and then the relevant information deemed here is the fact that if her child is on the child protection register, there's issues about whether she really is suited to the idea of supervision of children. Yeah. Um, so she brings judicial proceedings, uh, judicial review proceedings, sorry, uh, claiming that the disclosure was in breach of her right to respect for private life under Article 8. Um, but ultimately, the, the bottom line is um, the claim does fail. Um, but, but the issue isn't so much about the fact that it fails. It's about how it's about the balancing process and just being a landmark decision about trying to ensure that there is a fair balance between the public and, and the private. Because obviously, normally, and certainly before that, the biggest issue was people saw, well, the public right could be 64 million people, whereas your individual right, you're, you're just the one. And so people sometimes weighing it in that situation and then quite clearly the one is always going to lose if you're going to look at massive group versus one. Yeah, so just, just pausing there and just, just to highlight where the, where the tension is in yeah. this sort of factual scenario. You've, you've got a lady who has obviously been in contact with sexual services, they've yes. expressed some concerns over how she's been looking after her own child and she applies for a job as a dinner lady. Mm -hmm. um, 
And on this enhanced DBS check, because it's, because it's a job involving children, that's why you have the enhanced check as opposed to um, the lower standard check. And because we're talking about enhanced checks, these sorts of um, anecdotal, unproven, acquittal, all these sorts of information can be put in that um, report and we'll come on to the test later so I won't I won't sort of like um, uh, yeah jump jump in there and look at the at, at the at what, what the test is with, with putting that in but the reality is on this occasion clearly it was in there that there was this concern and the problem for the individual of course is that any employer if you've got a selection you've got a pool of people to choose from in order to uh, you know uh, decide who's going to get this position as a dinner lady someone with an, with, with a, an ECRC with anything negative on it they're out aren't they I mean, that's, that's, out. that's that's the Very simple. that's the reality I mean we'll come on to um, to uh, the postscript to the AR case um, a bit later in the uh, in the video but um, and there are differing views as to how how employers might might view something like that but I certainly without a shadow of a doubt lean towards um, the view expressed by one of the judges whose name I name forget but we'll come to it um, who says you know that that that's that's a showstopper? That's a game changer. That's a you know that that's a cliff edge, yeah, right. and you've and you've gone and you've you've stepped over. Um, there is no doubt in 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 our risk averse sort of culture, certainly risk averse employment culture that we have, you know, uh, by necessity um, throughout the country. You know, you're just not going to get anyone employing anybody in those circumstances. You are out, mm -hmm. and so the tension becomes, you know, should that be disclosed? taking into account that it wasn't some sort of, on the facts of this case, it wasn't a criminal conviction. Mm -hmm. um, she might well dispute these, these opinions that have been had about her parenting um, responsibility. Um, you know, is it right really for that to be on there when, to all intents and purposes, the people putting it on there know full well that's going to stop her getting their job? Yes. Um, and I suppose specifically on the facts of this case, you could also have an argument. I, I, I'm, I don't recall whether it actually came up. Um, but the extent to which dinner ladies actually supervise the children. I mean, they're, they're, they're serving them meals, and they might actually go around and collect plates, tidy up, I suppose. They might have those sorts of duties as well, so where they might come into more contact with well, children. I think, but and certainly some who might be in the playground, if you like, supervising what's going on in that regard. Yeah, they if they've got those duties as well, I suppose, then, 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 yeah, then, then there will be a lot, a lot more contact and direct, direct supervision. Yeah. So those are the tensions. This, yeah. this is why they matter, because you know anybody... You know, listening to this um, podcast, watching this video, you could find you could find yourself in a situation where you have a neighbour dispute or whatever, a problem in the family. Someone makes an entirely fictitious, malicious allegation against you of a variety of different things, but it could include sexual assault, sexual offences, mm -hmm. these sorts of things. Um, and you could be acquitted, or you might never actually be charged, but you might be arrested and questioned, and these sorts of things. And on an, an, on, a, on an enhanced DBS check, on one of these enhanced um, certificates, there is a real danger that that information will appear in this soft intelligence section. Yes. Um, and they might be entirely false, entirely fictitious, um, and yet they may well stop you getting a job. Um, and that's a really, really bitter pill to, to, to swallow. And therefore, not surprisingly, people bring challenges and say, look, whoa, hang on, this is really unfair. And every case, of course, is different on its facts. Yes. Some are going to be stark and obvious, um, some aren't. Um, but I think by, by necessity, the, the really stark ones probably get dealt with between the individual and the police before the certificate yeah, is absolutely. disclosed. So uh, we'll, um, we'll, we'll come on to that a bit later, the, the different stages of challenge. And the ones that get to court are naturally going to be the ones that are a bit more 50-50. Well, but, um, but it's really important that these cases actually get us to a position where we've got some sort of roadmap to steer people through how to make these sorts of decisions, particularly um, the chief officers at, at the various police um, authorities who, who take the decision as to what does and what doesn't go on these certificates. So uh, forgive me for that, for no, that, no, that no, diversion, absolutely. but I think setting the scene with that sort of context is, is, is really quite helpful, just, just with people bearing their minds as they uh, watch and or uh, listen to what we're discussing. So um, I stopped you in the middle of L, didn't I? So, so is there anything else more you want to say about L before we Not specifically, to because our, our previous video looks at all the different rationales and things that are specific to it, but it, it's just important to mention since it is something that... 
is always mentioned as sort of the backbone amongst all the sort of thinking processes and melting pot, if you like, uh, amongst the decision making um, in these sorts of cases. And certainly is mentioned in this uh, and is sort of mentioned within the context of still being the, the leading case. Um, but moving on to, to this particular one, now it's slightly different because th there isn't so much an argument over the, the specific facts in, in the same way as perhaps L, but you've got a situation where you've got AR, um, and this is looking at sort of paragraph eight, it, it gives a brief sort of look at some of the facts, but essentially he's a married man, he's got children, he's aged nearly 33 at this particular time, which is sort of January 2011, um, and then he is acquitted of a rape charge. Um, this is at Bolton uh, Crown Court, yes. Um, now it's following this, now he's a teacher by trade, but he happens to be working or, or wanting to, uh, he's, he was he's accused whilst being a cabbie, yeah. exactly. So he's a taxi driver at the time, and it, it, you can imagine the situation, um, or at least the allegation being sort of taken to a secluded area, that type of allegation. But the bottom line, he is acquitted. And then so moving on to sort of uh, later on, he actually applies for a job as a lecturer. And it's this situation in which the ECRC process comes about. So it says, 21st of March 2011, ECRC is issued. Um, and under the other relevant information, there's, there's two paragraphs uh, which were written, giving sort of arguable bare facts of what happened. And, and it simply says, on the 4th of November 2009, police were informed of an allegation of rape a 17-year-old female alleged that while she had been intoxicated and travelling in a taxi, the driver had conveyed to her to uh, conveyed her to a secluded location where he forcibly had sex with her without her consent. AR was identified as the driver and was arrested. Upon interview, he stated that the female had been a passenger in his taxi, but denied having sex with her, claiming she had made sexual advances towards him, which he had rejected. Following consideration by the Crown Prosecution Service, he was charged with rape of female aged 16 years or over and appeared before Bolton Crown Court on the 21st of January 2011, where he was found not guilty and the case was discharged. So you can imagine this is, you're going for a job as a lecturer and if you've got on your ECRC what I've literally just read, so that's a quote of what was put in there, uh, it certainly puts you in a lot of difficulties yeah, at the very beginning. That. And, and so sort of what ends up happening is he puts an objection forward. So 20th of April 2011, it says AR submitted an objection uh, and he wrote, there is no conviction. The jury rejected the complainant's evidence and the disclosure of the allegation is so prejudicial, so prejudicial as to prevent me from being fairly considered for employment. Even if the disclosure of the allegation was possibly appropriate, the disclosure fails to provide a full account of the evidence given and how the jury came to its conclusion. It is wrong, unfair, and gross, grossly prejudicial that I should have to defend myself every time I apply for employment after the jury have ruled I am an innocent man. Mm. So this is the sort of landscape of the case. You're looking at situations where somebody uh, has been, uh, or an allegation's been made, they've been arrested, charged, they've gone to court, which is, the nature of our judicial process, certainly in the criminal uh, courts, where it is for a jury, or certainly of these types of more serious cases where it goes to a Crown Court, it is for a jury to ultimately decide whether someone is guilty or not guilty. Now here's a situation, someone is found not guilty, and I'm sure at the end there would be incredible relief, but depending on what type of skill set you have, what type of job you're going to be going, going for in the future, um, you might not realise at that moment this, this really isn't the end of your challenge. Yes, you've mm -hmm. been found not guilty, um, but there's going to be certain types of employment that you're going to struggle to potentially get um, by virtue of this allegation. And so simply, it may not be the end of it. Yeah. But that's probably a good place just, just to run very briefly through um, the level the levels of, of challenges and appeals that he yeah. must run through to get to judicial review. So what, what, what are the lower levels of, of challenge that he undoubtedly must have passed yeah. through? Well, certainly the levels of challenge that exist now, I mean, basically, in, in, normally you'll get sort of a, a template disclosure from the police, 
um, and that gives you the right to, to make your objection. So certainly he makes an objection to the police, um, which I read out. The police then have the choice to either amend it, uh, amend your certificate, uh, delete it from the certificate, or, or you know, hold on to the, the viewpoint they took at, at the outset. Um, certainly that's what happens here. But then what happens after that point? So you've initially tried to essentially appeal it to the police. The police have said no and refuse. Then you can go to what's called the independent monitor, which is an independent body. They will look at much of the same uh, viewpoints, but ultimately it is an independent sort of viewpoint. Again, similar situation. They can delete it, amend it, or, or not change it at all. And then if the independent monitor uh, hasn't agreed in changing it, um, then judicial review is your, your, your next process. And this is where this comes into play. Um, the yep. judicial review itself is actually against uh, you know, Greater Manchester Police and sort of the rationale put forward by them. Um, but essentially judicial review being that, that standardised sort of public challenge against public bodies making it an opinion uh, and you looking at certain types of grounds on which you can bring those challenges. Yeah. So he so so the decision that we're looking at is the decision of the Supreme Court. So he's gone through the High yes. Court, Court of Appeal, and up to the top court in the land, the Supreme Court. Yes. Um, and so, what what arguments were he was he deploying before the stream Supreme Court to try and um, get them to overturn the decision of the Court of Appeal? Well, so I mean, there's um, in, in terms of the submissions put forward. Um, firstly, they look at whether, or, or at least the submission his his barrister put forward mm. is whether the Court of Appeal should have carried out their own view of proportionality. Yep. Now, the reason I mention that is essentially the Court of Appeal looked, or at least they decided, first we have to make a decision whether we see um, whether there's been a, a significant error of law. I can't remember whether it's a significant error of law or mm. a serious error of, error of law. Um, only if we identify that there's been um, this significant error of law, do we then have to carry out our own proportionality test? So yeah. um, the viewpoint uh, his, um, you know, he was taking in this situation is that that's too narrow a test. To say significant or serious error of law is such a narrow, restrictive situation. Significant error of principle. Yes. I think is the, um, is the phrase. But yeah, you're right. The, 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 the court said, yes. look, you know, you can't lose in the High Court and then try and get a reassessment of proportionality Absolutely. in the Court of Appeal and then a reassessment of proportionality. It, it's not meant to be the trial again. Yeah, that is, essentially, that, is, that is essentially retrying the same issue every single time. So unless there's been um, uh, unless there's been a significant error, then, then it, yeah. it's not going to... Well, well certainly, so the counter-submission um, was that it wasn't necessary or practicable to conduct a mini trial in these situations. Ultimately, you look at some of the major factors that um, have been looked at from L and their view, the sort of counter view was well, when you looked through the different factors, so things like, um, let's have a look here, you've got reliability, whether you've been given a rebuttal chance, uh, whether the information is relevant, um, the period of time elapsed and the impact of disclosure. Obviously, period of time, you know, 20 years ago versus one or two years, it, it's a totally different situation. Here, we've got a situation where the ECRC is being issued literally two months, I think, after the acquittal. So relatively, mm. albeit the acquittal isn't the date the offence happened, but again, I think the, the offence date is November 2009, the ECRC being issued... March 2011, so it's still so within a couple really, of years. Yeah, they're really quite, quite close to Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, yes, the impact of the disclosure, of course, is looking at the, the individual themselves. Um, but essentially, the, the, the counter-argument to whether there should be, by default, um, a look at proportionality by the Court of Appeal, um, AR was saying there should be, um, and that this you know, significant error of principle is too narrow, Mm. Um, the respondent is saying you can't do a mini trial, it's just too onerous. Mm. Uh, and the ultimate decision um, at paragraph 64 and 65 is um, the, the viewpoint from the court, uh, certainly in this case, is you shouldn't limit, to it, shouldn't limit it to significant error of principle, nor rely on a specific policy or law being infringed. So they were saying it, it sometimes is too difficult to say they can only win if they can point to a specific law that's been sort of 
can imagine a piece of statute that's being ignored or something like that. Um, so on the one hand, it's not for the Court of Appeal to second guess the Court of First Instance, but it does sort of lower it somewhat and says, if the Court of Appeal can consider whether there has been an error or, for example, a flaw in the reasoning or logic, if you like, then they can consider a reassessment in that situation. Sure. Um, so it, it, it lowers it a little bit, but it's, it's certainly not agreeing that there's got to be a default uh, proportionality reassessment um, just off the bat, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other challenges that they bring is um, looking at Article 8, which is really the, the main crux of what we'll look at now. And they say that there was a substantive error and that there was a procedural error. Um, in regards to the procedural error, to be fair, we can bat that away, that the court take the view that um, by the time uh, all this gets to court, and certainly by the time the police were looking at it, because there was uh, more than one disclosure at various points, it, it, it ultimately said when the police, uh, so, so the actual ECRC that was being challenged here, because it wasn't necessarily the first one, um, it said ultimately the police knew what his defence was going to be, that was forming part of their natural decision-making process at that particular moment anyway. And ultimately, there was no indication on the facts from, from what had been put forward that there was any more information to advance anyway. So from a practical perspective, I think the court's saying, well, <coughs> apologies. The court was saying, even if you had um, not been given a procedural sort of, you know, a point to which you could have objected, is there any new information you would have bring, brought to the party, essentially? And if the yeah. answer is no, then it's a, it's a moot point here. Yeah, they're essentially saying they had the full picture. Yes. Yeah. And then they go on to look at this... Um, I mean, it, you, you read out earlier uh, AR's own... Um, uh, yes. The points he was making specifically with regards to saying, look, you know, I've been found innocent. Yes. And, and now I'm getting prejudiced and that's completely... You know, it's going to stop me working and that's completely unfair. Absolutely. Um, and this is where we'll move to sort of the reliability point of things, essentially. Mm. Um, I mean, just looking at the substantive side of things, that's, that's again, looking at, essentially looking at the proportionality. So you've got, on the one hand, like I mentioned earlier, the rights of the public and the understandable need that we as a society want to protect children, want to protect sure, vulnerable sure. adults. They are classed as groups and the specific barred lists that exist to pre prevent people carrying out regulated activity or essentially work connected with those two groups. But on the other hand, us as individuals and the skill set that you have, so in this case, the skill set AR has, he is a teacher, he's going for a um, lecturer post. And it, it, whilst on paper it can be as simple as said, well, you can go and get another job. It, it's really not that simple. You know, when you are, when you have a particular skill set, and perhaps, for example, that is, you know, certainly a lot of people, their job is their vocation, um, and that is what you take pride in. Um, so it, it's not as simple to just say to people like AR, well, you've done teaching potentially a lot of your life, but, you know, you just have to do something else now, especially given the fact that AR would principally say, I was found not guilty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I'm innocent... And you're innocent then, until proven guilty, and yet it doesn't seem that way when you're prevented from getting a job when it turns up on your enhanced DVS check. Because it's it's an indirect penalty, effectively, um, even though you've been found not guilty. Hmm. Um, and this sort of moves into the the arguments about different standards of proof, um, which, which does get rejected by the court. I mean, there is some argument from the respondent where they say... Well, the CPS obviously charged AR, and that meant at some point the CPS had to consider whether there was a realistic prospect of conviction. Mm -hmm. And when they considered that question, they decided, yes, there was a realistic prospect of conviction. And so they try and sort of make a, an equivalence with the idea of balance of probabilities. And, and actually, the court rejects it. The court doesn't say that you can essentially say... Well, because the CPS decided there was a realistic prospect of conviction, that must mean automatically that perhaps on balance of probabilities, it's more likely true that it did happen than it didn't. Um, and certainly one of the reasons the court rejects it is, 
they're saying, well, if you're going to have those as sort of equivalencies, then you're almost ignoring the next step in the criminal process, which is it then went to trial. It then was subject to uh, cross-examination from both sides and the individual was acquitted. Um, and that is obviously a fact. So to I mean, ignore it is a problem. I mean, it seems that um, AR was raising the argument yes. that um, uh, unless the officers in question were in a position to form a view of, of his likely guilt, that it shouldn't be on his, um, his DPS. Mm-hmm. So he's suggesting that there needs to be essentially, or necessarily, a reassessment of the evidence at trial, almost like a retrial on paper, and they have to form an independent judgment of their own as to whether or not he was or, or was not likely to be guilty. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, you know, I, th- I think quite rightly, um, the court rejected that and said, you know, um, it is not necessary or appropriate for those responsible for ECRCs to conduct a detailed analysis of the evidence at trial. Yes, I mean, that's just fraught with problems, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, because you, you, if that was the case, you'd get into an argument. Where, so someone would say, well, I've considered the evidence and I think it is more likely than not that you were guilty. Um, and then the response will be, how can you form that opinion? You know, where, how, you know you, that's irrational and you'd have challenges upon, no, on, upon those grounds. Um, so I, I, think, I think it's right. Um, you know, I say that somewhat reg- regrettably, but I think it is right that that's just not a practical thing for, yes. for the police to do or for the courts on appeal via JR in these sort of circumstances yes. to have to get involved with. Um, so then it, then it moves on. Well, just on that point, I mean, the Supreme Court do sort of, uh, they, they just sort of outline that situation specifically just to make it clear near to the, towards the end where they say, Ultimately, it isn't the function of the chief officer to replicate the role of the court. Sure, that, um, I mean, that, that obviously makes sense. Exactly. Their job is to identify and disclose relevant information, and, and essentially that's it. You know, identify information and disclose it if it's relevant, and you know, all the different considerations are had. You have a right to challenge it, and you know, that's the process that exists. Yeah. Uh, and you may succeed, you may unfortunately fail. And certainly, obviously, we'll get to some of the reasons, but um, in this situation, it, it does fail. Um, you know, there's a lot of different arguments that come out. Some of them are, are not dealt with in a lot of detail. The reason is, is the Supreme Court um, decides quite quickly which ones they think have um, some meat in them, if you like. And other ones, I, I think very much it's, it's perhaps these aren't the right facts for us to really explore those issues. And um, certainly one of them, it, it looks at Article 6 um, in regards to procedure and you know, right of fair trial, but it doesn't really deal with the idea of, of that too much. The challenge put forward is the idea of presumption of innocence. And again, much of that ties into what we've said already, so there's not too much more to be had with that. Um, but certainly sort of going towards the end of the matter, you've got... You know, the ultimate idea of you've got that balance, um, which is going to exist. And ultimately, the court is saying that Parliament has made law and, and the law that they have made does permit these sorts of, ch- these sorts of things yeah. to be put in. Um, yeah. It is quite express in terms of the statutory authorities that the section for you know, essentially other information, soft intelligence, it does exist and it's not accidentally put there. And, and within that context, um, whilst most people in this sort of situation for acquittals, they're going to feel, understandably, that I've been acquitted, it should be the end of it. There shouldn't be a further conversation. And mm-hmm. certainly in the objections that he puts forward, um, just to remind everyone, it says it is wrong, unfair, and grossly prejudicial that I should have to defend myself every time I apply for employment after the jury have ruled I am an innocent man. I mean, you could have sympathy with that absolutely with that, with that statement, but the unfortunate thing is, is Parliament hasn't enacted that situation. Yes, Parliament uh, and the court ultimately, yes, they're there to interpret law, but they're not there to rewrite statutory authorities. Mm. And obviously, since L, there's been Protection Freedoms Act, there's been changes as as things have gone on. But certainly one of the changes that hasn't 
that, that hasn't been taken away by Parliament and courts have no authority to overrule is is the idea of soft intelligence and allegations. Yeah. And, and they, they move on, don't they, paragraphs 69 and 70, to saying that um, yeah. the judge went, uh, went no further than to accept, as he was entitled to do, that the chief, chief constable's view that the information was not lacking substance and that the allegations might be true. It was a matter for him to assess whether the information was of a sufficient, I think, uh, weight uh, uh, on the Article 8 balance. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, 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 you know, the, the, the officer deciding whether or not to put the, the, this information, this soft intelligence, you know, allegations of, or allega- unproven allegations, acquittals, these sorts of things, on the um, ECRCs uh, has to bear in mind those, th- those sorts of ideas that it wasn't lacking substance and might be true. Uh, and the Supreme Court just said that they agreed with the Court of Appeal. They didn't think that AR had um, identified an error in the original judge's reasoning mm. and there was nothing to suggest, certainly from the Supreme Court's point of view, that um, certainly the reasoning for the proportionality argument mm. um, if there wasn't any identified error, again, putting aside whether it's a significant principle or significant error, just looking at it from a, a pure error side of things, there wasn't anything that they could grapple with that they felt would allow them to make a positive decision. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then just sort of moving towards the end, um, from paragraph 72, you've got the postscript, if you like, yeah. where judges share some of their concerns sort of going forward and um, from some of the things that have come out from this so I, I don't know if you want to say some things at the beginning just yeah well, I think I think this is um, I'm not going to read it all but um, this is where the court just expressed some concern as, as to the practicalities of these situations and I think they were they were expressing concern from the point of view of clearly having some sympathy for AR as far as I uh, as far as I read it yes um, and they make the point here they say given that Parliament has clearly authorised the inclusion of in ECRCs of soft information, as we have been referring to, including disputed allegations, there may be no logical reason to exclude information about serious allegations of criminal conduct merely because prosecution has not been pursued or failed. So they're making the point, which we've obviously touched upon already, um, that you know it, it's quite clear that the scheme is set up and parliamentary intention is, is that the, this information can go in. So nobody's going to be successful challenging the fact that there is that sort of soft intelligence there because the, it's clearly set up for that to be Certainly included. not in a court. Ultimately, it's about, if you want that to change, there's a degree to which you need almost pressure groups to get Parliament to change the law. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So in terms of you know the fact of, a, of an acquittal, it goes on to say, in principle, even acquittal by a criminal court following a full trial can be said to imply no more than that the charge has not been proven beyond reasonable doubt. In principle, it leaves open the possibility that the allegation was true and the risks uh, associated with that. Yeah. Um, and again, you know, I have great sympathy for people in these situations, and so I, I do say somewhat regrettably that uh, you know that has to be right. Um, and it, but but it goes on to make to make some further points, which I, I think are quite quite important. And he says, however, I'm concerned by the lack of information about how an ECRC is likely to be treated by potential employers in any such case. Miss Richards was at pains as one of the representatives to emphasise that the ECRC is only part of the information available and will not necessarily lead to failure. In other words, failure to get a job. I, 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 I think that's nonsense, yeah. <laughs> frankly. Uh, and, and, and he goes on to say, on the other hand, L- um, Lord Neuberger, I think quite correctly, assumed um, that an adverse ECRC would be a killer blow for an application. Uh, for a sensitive post, and that must be right. Yes, I mean that that has to be right. Certainly, the difficulty they have is there's no way of obtaining accurate statistics as to whether it's having an, an effect, whether it's had an effect or not. Um, certainly, the government can't really obtain any sensible statistics of that sort. Employers aren't yeah. going to start, you know, sort of creating tick lists of this sorts of yeah. things. I mean, it does mention that. You know, there's concern that there's no clear guidance as to what weight should be given to an acquittal in different circumstances. Yeah. Um, and I think certainly the court were taking the view that surely at this stage there should be some sort of guidance note that says in acquittal situations, which is actually arguably better than cases such as L, 
because in an acquittal situation, arguably, it's been, tested. Long, it's been yeah, tested. It's been tested yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, surely there's got to be some sort of guidance note which tells chief officers this is how to consider those cases. This is the weight to attach to it, yeah. rather than leaving it to a sort of open-ended uh, yeah. viewpoint. And that's, that's got to be right. In fact, his final comment in, in paragraph seventy-six, which I'll read as well, he said. These issues require further consideration outside the scope of this appeal. Careful thought needs to be given to the value in practice of disclosing allegations which have been tested in court and which have led to acquittal. The figures noted above um, show that the number of ECRCs relating to acquittals um, represent a very small proportion of the whole. This may suggest that in many cases, chief officers find no cause for disclosure of risks in case following as a, following acquittals. So on one hand, he seems to be saying, well, you know, we need guidance about this to help them make decisions. And then at the end, he, I almost read him to be saying, um, but there's so few of them that they're probably getting these value decisions right anyway. Yes. So we should have some better guidance, but things are probably OK. Um, if that's not clear, what, what, just, just to phrase it another way, he's saying, well, there are so many, there are so few, sorry, um, completely the opposite, so few um, cases in, involving disputes regarding disclosure of acquittals that, that it's highly likely that there is only a very small number of acquittals from a bigger pool of acquittals which are not put on um, ECRCs. And so clearly he seems to be assuming, um, although clearly he thinks he's assuming correctly, that there's lots of cases where the, you know, the chief officers decide not to include um, details of acquittals on, on, the, on ECRCs. Um, but anyway, I mean, the, so the implication is, it's the implication is, I suppose, from that, is he saying chief officers are probably on balance getting it right more yeah. than they're not, which they might well be. I mean, I'm not saying they're not. I mean, we can't possibly um, form a judgment on that. Of um, but the concern is, is that if you don't have clear guidance, you might have different um, uh, chief officers taking entirely different value judgments in different sorts of cases, and you might have an, an entirely inconsistent application. Um, across different different police forces, yes. which is not really what the, where we sh where we should be. No, no, it's not post COVID um, um, issues. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it, it really there really should be some um, some consistency. So, um, I think that's just to wrap up. I mean, I think that that largely sort of like covers the issues that we wanted yes. to to touch upon in this uh, this this video and podcast. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, there are numerous other podcasts uh, and videos in this uh, In Conversation series, uh, many of which I, I, I hope that you might uh, find time to watch or listen to, and that you might also find uh, helpful and useful and informative. Um, and join us again next time. Uh, thank you.